All right, well, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes here to talk about kids. So if I please ask the panel participants to take your, take your seats. All right, welcome everybody to our panel about kids and voice assistance. My name is David Bain. I run Washington's only technology agnostic trade, technology trade association. It's called the Technology Safety Council. And unlike associations that are uh, jealously protecting one particular technology or the other, we, we exist to give a non-sugar-coated assessment of best practices and risks about any technology including artificial intelligence, drones, driverless vehicles. In fact, um, screens and digital, digital well-being are, are one of the big issues now. We haven't done a deep dive on, on voice assistance, but um, in, in speaking with P Pete Erickson about uh, presenting at this conference here, um, we discussed the fact that voice is a really good way to avoid the new smoking, it's not sugar, it's not sitting. The new smoking is screen time. Screen time, especially in the evening, especially for kids. And so I'll give a couple of brief remarks about what are the risks of using screens and how does, how does voice obviate the, the need for screen. And then we'll go into the real experts who are our panelists to, to tell you exactly how it's done and what are the special considerations around this, this group of people this group of users. So, um, briefly about me, I run the Technology Safety Council in DC, it's in Arlington, and I've, I've worked on a whole bunch of different um, tech companies in California and uh, in the East Coast as well, events.com, Transpositional Modulation is a, is a company I started in Arizona uh, that deals with wireless tech. I'm very much a technology I insider uh, hence my tech optimistic viewpoint on these things, and yet we are all about not sugarcoating the important risks, especially where our kids are concerned. I'm a dad, and that's also the the, the, the very first role that I that I bring to this. My personal Houston, we have a problem moment in dealing with screens. Happened when my daughter dropped her iPhone, shattered on the floor. I said, no no worries. Send it off. You'll have it back in a, in a week or two. She's 13 years old, and she was like, oh, no, my, my snap streaks will be broken. <laughs> she became you know, almost apoplectic and was all of a sudden not her demure self. And, and I, I realized that we were dealing with an addiction situation because you know that's the medical definition of addiction. If there's a withdrawal involved and if some amount of detox actually improves the, the situation. So... Um, we're in the midst of a, a public health calamity happening right now, especially for kids under 13 years old. There are, um, there's an increase of teen suicide in girls. Of, uh, it's up 65% in the, in the recent five-year uh, five sample period. And it's completely connected to the isolation, anxiety, and, and so forth that people experience on screens. So our regulatory environment in Washington is very much in reactive mode. We are, uh, tech on the other hand is, is commercial, commercially um, uh, going at the, at the speed of light and um, smoking for instance, the, in 1953, even though for centuries we had, we, we had known, Europeans had known that there are negative health consequences associated with, with smoking, by 1953, the epidemiological evidence was very well sewn up, but yet it took another 40 years to really connect the dots in DC. So what exactly are the, are the risks um, for, for smartphone, uh, smartphone addiction and, and overuse of screens? And I won't go through all of this, but um, 
the the one that that I'm really interested in uh, because it doesn't get a lot of of press is the blue light phototoxicity that is overexposure, especially in the evening, to the light coming from our LED devices that have a preponderance of energy in that 430 nanometers range, 430 being the, the, the blue. Um, there, there, there are other issues. Um, spine surgeons, chiropractors, orthopedists will tell you they're having a, a, a real surge of people with, with neck issues. If you, even if you watch television today and compare the TV shows to the shows that we saw in the, in the 80s and the 90s, you'll notice that the actors playing the characters are, are a little more like hunched over because of our, our modern uh, technology. Uh, so let's see. To do a quick dive on the, the risk related to the blue light, um, what is the actual mechanism through which most of the damage is, is occurring? There is, um, there is uh, a big risk for macular degeneration. Macular degeneration is a form of blindness. It normally occurs in the population at a rate of around 1% of people in their 60s, but uh, a recent study of 15,000 people in Germany discovered that 3.8% of the sample participants had um, early onset of macular degeneration in their 30s and 40s. And it, and it is associated with screen use, as was discovered um, by researchers in Spain. So how precisely does this happen? The, the macula, the macula is the part of your retina that is responsible for detailed vision. Macula is a one millimeter by one millimeter patch of cells in the center of your retina. Without it, you cannot read, drive. Uh, it's responsible also for facial recognition. And once those cells are gone, they're nerve cells, they're gone. There's no current treatment that is restoring them. So, um, so another big issue is the depletion of N-acetyl-5-methoxytryptamine, also known as melatonin. Specifically, melatonin, when it becomes depleted, uh, is uh, having cascading consequences for immune health. Um, so leukemia, breast cancer, uh, are also associated with, with this. So I'll just finish this up so we can get to our panelists. And because that is the question that that's really important is how can we design for kids such that we are not um, causing them to, for their learning, for their entertainment and social interaction, how can they not use screens in the evening, but instead use the, the voice assistants. How, how, do we, how do we make that and yet not fall down the same uh, trap of, um, of making uh, addicting technologies and uh, go awry of the ethical framework that has so far held up very well. So what I'd like to do now is, is go uh, ask our panelists to grab your mics. We'll start on the left here and like each of you to introduce yourself and tell us about your companies. Hello, um, my name is Jeremy Wilkin. I'm a father of two and designer developer for voice apps as well as an engineer uh, at VMware. And my area of expertise is being a father. Um, my name is Patricia Scanlon. Um, I've been in the voice technology space for over 20 years, starting as an engineer and uh, worked in places like IBM Research and. Bell Labs before starting my own company and five years ago now. I'm also a parent, two kids. Um, so uh, I started a company specifically building speech recognition technology for children. So the focus of the company is very much on high accuracy, um, age appropriate interactions for children as well as uh, safe with respect to data privacy protection. 
My name is Katie Ernst. I also am a parent to uh, two children, and I am an attorney. But in my spare time, I founded the company Select a Story, and we make interactive uh, stories, think, choose your own adventure audiobooks um, for Alexa and Google Home. Hi, um, my name is Edva Levin. I am the founder of Pretzel Labs, which is a voice design company that creates kid skills on Alexa, um, such as Kids Chord and Free Dancers and Out the Door. So, Adva, did I say that correctly? Tell, tell us more about uh, Pretzel Labs and your experience. What's, what's specific, what specifically uh, are the, is the framework for your approach of designing for kids? Um, OK, so Pretzel Labs does uh, mostly games. We're also doing some work in education. Um, but our whole philosophy is to get kids entertained and um, get them to have fun and um, learn while they are having fun, but it's not very educational um, focused. And um, we're working like in voice because I feel like it's a super interesting medium for kids. I mean, just look at the physical setting in the room. Um, it allows them to move freely. It's um, super inclusive, like for the entire family. You don't really see kids, you know, across from a street uh, screen being very focused, but they can move, dance, um, talk to Alexa from the other side of the room. If a parent walks in, they hear everything. They can participate also. Um, and our games are designed in mind um, that like the entire family is either participating or around somewhere. Um, so they are all meant to have several members of the family. Uh, who, who would like to add about their their uh, design parameters for for dealing with uh, for designing for specific to kids. What's different for a kid's voice experience than than something you do for adults? Well, specifically, on there's two different sides to that. One is on the. Are you, are you on there? Am I? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Sorry. There's two different sides. One is the technology. That let's let's assume not everybody uses Alexa <laughs> for <laughs> for the purpose of the panel. Um, so it. The technology has to work for a child's voice. It has to be accurate. Uh, below the age of 12, uh, voice gets very different from adults. And then, depending on the technology in the background you're using, it may or may not be accurate. It can be accurate to some extent. When you get into educational sense and you're actually assessing the child's reading and the pronunciation, the accuracy expectation, I would imagine, is a lot higher. And then there's the matter of extracting uh, meaning from what the children are saying, so the actual language. So there is actual tools on the back end need to be quite appropriate, and whether it works for a ten-year-old, an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and then a four-year-old or a five-year-old is very different. And then there's the experience. I think there's two different sides. One would then be designing the actual products. So you guys are definitely designing the products that the child interacts with. The things that we do is similar to what Alexa would do, but we do it on a as we're an independent provider of speech recognition. So we're on the back end. So I think there's two different sides that you have to consider when you're building for children, what the child interacts with and what's on the back end. That's very interesting. Say, yeah. I think also when people think of designing for children, their first mind goes to things that are really for like two and three year olds. So for instance, we both entered the Kids Skill Challenge and I made a, they, they said that it was you know to be aimed, I think it was children from five to 12 was the, I. Uh, Amazon's range. And so the story that I made was aimed more like 8 to 12. But the vast majority of the entrants had things that were like ABC skills or counting skills or, or things that are really appropriate for a two or three year old, which is not even in the range that Amazon was asking for. And so I think one thing to think about when you're designing for children is that children are a lot smarter than I think people give them credit for. And a 12 year old doesn't necessarily want to do the same thing that a two year old wants to do or that a five year old wants to do. I agree, and I think just calling that whole group by the name kids is just a mistake. Um, even uh, we've done some research on, you know, like I broke it up to groups of two to four, four to six, six to eight, and then maybe eight to 12. We've got 
such different results on the way that kids can interact with Alexa, um, how they can follow a script. And based on what Patricia is doing, um, like two to four, Alexa doesn't really understand what they're saying many times. So we have such a breadth of uh, expertise here. Ultimately, we want to talk about things that you all are interested in. So um, let's open up to questions so that we can so we can talk specifically to your to your interests in in the back here. Let's see. Do we have someone with uh, who can deliver the mic here? And uh, to. To repeat, our, our panelists today are Adva from Pretzel, Pretzel Labs, uh, Katie, and your company again is? Select a story, like you select. Select a story. a story. Patricia from Soapbox Labs, and Jeremy from VMware, and I'm David from Tech Safety Council. So, Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So you started the presentation with uh, a lot of research uh, and um, Im negative impact of screens on kids. Uh, do you have a perspective on the potential negative impact of voice addiction, if you will, in not, not in the next one or two years, but eventually do you see this going into the similar direction as mobile addiction? Well, to, to answer as briefly as possible, um, there is a risk. There is a risk. I, I, if, you, if you will Google Alexa addiction, you won't find the zillions of, of uh, <coughs> results that you see with smartphone addiction and so forth, but you won't see nothing either. Um, I think the thing that protects the ecosystem so far is there isn't that slippery slope, the, f the feedback loop that Google, Facebook, Twitter, and others have where they're directly incentivized to keep your eyeballs on them as long as possible. Yes, uh, ecosystems like Alexa do have a, a vested interest in your being online and ordering ordering things from them, and that there's a direct economic interest there. But it's not uh, it's not just about keeping your attention. Um, but that is a very valid point. You know, um, let's. Uh, I wonder, does anyone else on the panel like to opine on? On you know good design, wh where do you draw the 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 de defining uh, definition between what is on one hand good design and on the other hand, well, it's so good it's addicting, it's so exactly. pleasurable that that I, it's habit forming. Um, uh, is this something that anyone has addressed in their in their design practice? I can speak a little to this. So my daughter's three; she's had. Alexa in the house and Google Home in the house pretty much whole life. So her experience is it's been there. So I'm getting to observe generation AI come up, basically. And my concern about the screens is there as far as her level of interest. She watches My Little Pony like there's nothing else going on in the, around the world. You cannot get to her when My Little Pony is on. And I see the same thing happen actually when she's listening to the uh, soundtrack of whatever show or things like that. So kids have an immersive world that they can go into. Uh, so it depends on what they're using it for. Um, is music and kind of being absorbed in music um, different from being absorbed in a screen? Certainly. I don't know all the research and things like that. But from a parent's perspective, um, I'm a little less concerned about it, but I still want her to respond when I say her name. <laughs> um, so, you know, and there's, there's some things about growing up and attention spans and things like that that have to be addressed. But when it comes to it, most of the things on voice and the platform are transactional, right? Set a timer, do this, do that. They, they help you complete a task. So the addictive behavior concern is a lot lower because you're not able to continue on. You've, you've completed that task and you're going to move on. So. Uh, screens absorb you because they're visually drawn into them and it leads you to the next tap or, or swipe or whatever. Uh, but if you're having a conversation, it, it's a very different experience and it, I think it triggers very different parts of the brain as well, which um, so far from my three-year-old observing uh, doesn't cause a lot of challenges other than, yeah. hey, listen to me. <laughs> the music's playing, I know, but the time for dinner. You I'm know, on the subject of the brain, just briefly, 
there is the, the whole 38-2 uh, rule that 30% of your neocortical uh, cells are involved in visual processing, 8% touch, and only 2 to 3% are actually involved in. So it is in, in sound processing. So it is a much less uh, engrossing uh, potential there. Uh, yes, I'll Katie. just say to the extent that you don't hear of Alexa being addictive in the same way as Facebook or whatever else that isn't uh, voice, it's because no one's been that successful yet. And I would say that developers, that is absolutely their goal because that's how you make money. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't consider um, whether we're addicting people, but I can tell you when I created my skill, uh, to have a skill that someone uses for more than 15 minutes is a pretty big deal because there are few um, games in which people interact that long with Alexa. And so I would watch through my bespoken counter, you could watch people playing as they played. And I watched people play for four hours. And I said, yes. I wasn't like, oh, wow. man, I think they're addicted. I was like, yes, they like my product. <laughs> so that's my perspective. Is, is there a, an ethical framework that, that needs to be provided around this, you know, it, wh wh where do you draw the line? Well, if, if people start becoming so seriously addicted to my product that uh, it's causing problems in their life, a la Facebook or whatever else, then I'll consider it. But um, I don't really think that's a, it, it's, it hasn't, it's not a problem right now. Yeah. Um, I agree that I think that would be good news for us. Maybe you should be more concerned and draw the line for us, um, but we are not at all near that point. Um, what I do think is not so much addictivity, but maybe an emotional um, connection yeah. that I think could somehow be an issue between kids and like Alexa. That, that's um, a good thought. Yeah. And that's not so much on skills, but basically on the platform in general is what I've been seeing is that a lot of them really treat Alexa sort of as a real person or as a friend. Um, and... It's, I think it's very interesting to see where it goes. I'm, I don't think it's dangerous. Would a child be sad if Alexa wasn't there? Um, yeah, and I mean, like I've seen, we've done some work in classrooms where we put in several Alexas for kids to work in groups. So you can hear them saying, like, my Alexa doesn't like me. Um, or I got the stupid Alexa because they can't get her to do something that the other group has. Um, so they are like sort of really treating her um, as not really a person, but something, an entity that has feelings. Um, and I think that's just really interesting to see where it will go. All right, more of your questions, please. Uh, there's one right in the back there. Hello. Um, does COPA compliancy in the work that you guys do impact the quality and quantity of the amount of kids' content available through speech devices? Um, absolutely. Um, Amazon is super strict, as they should be, about uh, complying with COPA for third-party skills. Um, so we are not collecting, at least I'm not, I'm sure you aren't also, um, like any information on our users. Um, it makes it, I mean, quite difficult, like, you know, to, like, adapt to specific users or to create an ongoing um, experience for them. Um, but that is where the line is drawn very strictly. I think there is, um, all voice data is actually recorded and stored. And I think if you look at the uh, data privacy policies, you might have to dig a deep into it, but it is actually a fact of most any cloud-based speech recognition systems are collecting voice data. And what is done with the voice data is actually, you know, it, it's worth looking at. Um, you know, because I think sometimes we have this view that COPPA protects us or GDPR in the EU protects us. And actually it doesn't. What you've done is you've just given permission for the company, the operator, to do whatever they do want to do with the voice data. They do for adults, for children. But you as the parent have control. So you get to say for the child whether they should have access to this. But, but you know, I mean, everybody should realize that, that once you actually give permission, you have given permission for the voice data to be collected, stored, mined, et cetera. And, you know, and everybody needs to wake up to that a little bit, that that's just a fact, right? And there's business models other than improving speech recognition in a lot of companies. And I think that's where GDPR came in. And GDPR took COPPA to another level 
where they actually want not just uh, you know the right you know to give over your permission, but also there needs to be transparency. So I think what the industry needs to do actually is to call for more transparency and actually to step up and say right up in front what's being collected, what's being done with the data once it's collected, and you know I think would build a bit more faith um, with parents in the usage because what's happening now you're getting a drip feed of, of, of you know okay we all feel safe because cop is taking care of it but you know and then all of a sudden it gets exposed kind of what happened with Facebook everybody what you know you did sign up on data privacy uh, rules and then everybody was horrified when they found out what, had, what was actually happening but you know as Mark Zuckerberg sat there and went well you all signed up you know yeah. and, and that's actually the same thing so I think you know when it comes to children's speech I think that transparency needs to be, uh, you know, done as as it is expected to to begin to be done in, in GDPR, and I think California is introducing certain rules around that as well. That might Very help it. Very interesting. In in your work with uh, Soapbox Labs, do you rely on the platform for managing those sorts of permissions, or how much of it do you have to worry about yourself on the design level? Yeah, it, it, it's a real problem. Like it, it's it, it was a problem for us from the beginning. It was really costly and expensive and, and risky to, to get into this. Um, but, you know, we have to comply. We've complied since the beginning. GDPR ensures everybody complies. You just need explicit permission from the parents. So we're actually like the, the, the engine um, that we actually license our technology to third parties and they incorporate it into their um, products. So we, our API license agreement with our third party is that third parties have to get permission from the parents to, to use their device. Um, and that's just legal compliance. It's probably the moral, ethical transparency that, that people should be signing up to as well, I think. What but about VMware's uh, approach to this topic? Well, so I'm not representing VMware in this conversation, but um, uh, from the perspective of skills or actions, I mean, you put a Google Home or an Alexa or any device in the home, it's communal. So whether it's explicitly built for children or not, children will likely get a chance to use it unless you lock it up. Um, as soon as my daughter could say Alexa, she took control. Like, we didn't start allowing permission. It just started happening. So you have to also know that it's not just kids-focused actions and skills, but also all things that, as long as they have access to a device. I was going to say that, ironically, with COPPA, you only need to worry about being compliant if you label your skill a kid's skill. Mm -hmm. So you can make the same exact skill and just label it a game. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about any of that. So if you're a designer and you're deciding what you want to do, you can, you, on the one hand, it can be helpful to be labeled a kid's skill because there are far fewer of them. And so they can be more easily found for people that are searching for that specifically. On the other hand, obviously, Older kids may not want to play a kid's skill, and then you have to worry about Amazon not just being COPPA compliant, but they are very concerned about anything that might in any way reflect badly upon them as a kid's skill, but whereas they'll let most anything as a game. So we actually have two different versions of our game, one as a game with additional content and one as a kid's skill. Very good. More questions? So um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, continue this this thread, right? Uh, I'm kind of surprised that uh, uh, that Adva, you would uh, basically acknowledge that you're not storing any data, uh, but uh, but you're allowing Amazon to essentially have all the kids' voices, right? Uh, so so the entire premise of Alexa for kids is something that's questionable for me as a parent. I don't want my kids' voices on Amazon's cloud or Google's cloud or IBM's cloud. Uh, so I just want to see if uh, you have thoughts about uh, how that's uh, something that would be you know, corrected uh, as we go along. Um, so what I meant is me as a third-party developer, I don't get any of that data at all. Um, sure, Amazon but you're enabling it uh, by, by putting these games or developing these games. You're enabling Amazon to essentially collect uh, kids', uh, kids voices. I'm not enabling Amazon. I mean, Amazon is collecting whatever they are, and I'm sure they are complying with the stricter rules. Um, and if they are collecting the voice recordings from kids skills, that is not something we have any access to. We are not even getting the raw text. 
No, nonetheless, the, the point remains that, in fact, the voice recordings are on Amazon's cloud, right? So, uh, so in fact, I'm, it kind of surprises me that there isn't uh, more of a pushback, in America at least, uh, about uh, you know these voice assistants, basically live microphones sitting in people's uh, uh, living rooms and now going into classrooms and kids' bedrooms. I, I think the, the, the kids' skill, if it is a kid, they will make the parent give permission. And maybe that's part, I think it's part of the Alexa for kids thing, that when you sign up, it's a premium service, right? But like I said earlier, right, they might do it once, and then you have, to, you have the right to download as many skills as you want, and they are collecting data for all those skills. But at mm -hmm. one point, you did give permission, I think. Right. So I, is that I, order, I'm pretty sure that's the yeah. it, So people get very annoyed about this. It, you have to enable every single kid skill in order for it to be COPPA compliant. So if a kid wants to play a kid skill, the parent has to go into the app or otherwise enable that skill. So people will say, wait, so in order for my kid to play a skill for kids, we have to you know, actively say yes. But if my kid just wants to play any old other adult skill, I don't have to. It seems backward. It's because of COPPA. But yes, if you don't like the idea of Amazon recording your child's voice, you should not have an Alexa device. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this whole conversation, I think, is really taking responsibility from the parents. Um, what is the parents' role in this? It's not. I think it's one of those things. It's kind of like it's back to what happened with Facebook. I think everybody, everybody's just so excited with this amazing thing that makes their life all fun and stuff, and, and we give over permission. Um, and then later, I think the ramifications come in about a year or two, and everybody sits back and goes, oh, maybe I didn't really want that to happen because there's implications to it, and people... But, like, technology is wonderful, and everybody just embraces it and moves forward. I mean, I think it, sometimes it's hindsight. We all sit back and reflect on... on you know, wh when something bad happens, if we all find out our voice, kids' voice data was was taken and stuff like that, or resold or something like that. I think, but I think that's a conversation. Genuinely, I think that's a conversation we all should have, um, and say where is the responsibility? And these are our kids we're talking about. It's not just but convenient to turn on the light. You know, aren't these uh, skills if they're in the Amazon Kids library, so to speak, aren't they curated and therefore covered by Amazon's COPA compliance? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so that would relieve a lot of the developers' responsibility. No, it does, right? Because you guys don't have to get permission. It's covered under uh, Amazon, yeah. Okay, that's what I was getting at. Question up front. Can we bring the mic, please? But I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about what COPPA really covers. I mean, th there's the, it, the, the intent of the law or the spirit of the law versus how it's actually implemented. So the, so the intent of the law is that it's probably a larger thing beyond just we want to make sure that parents understand how their children's data is being collected, but the broader intent is we want to make sure that children are protected from being advertised to, that's like the big thing, and then also that they're not exposed to inappropriate content. Now, the way that Amazon and Google have chosen to implement that is it doesn't necessarily mean that the spirit of the law is going to be taken care of because but what they're basically saying is that you as a parent must read these guidelines and then once you say you give parental consent and then somehow we have this technology that ensures that it's really you giving your parental consent and when you've done that um, you only have to do it once. But as a designer of kids' skills, because I am one also, they're not policing every single thing that goes into our skill. I mean, yes, they look at it in general, but if you have dynamic content, if I have, uh, you know, a skill that has a different story, they're not going to read every single story that I put in there, and I might put something in that particular story that doesn't make a parent happy. There may be some, in that particular story, a child fibs about, something because that's part of the story and one parent says hey if you're teaching my kid how to lie then I'm you know I'm not I'm going to disable your skill so there's a broad range of things that could still potentially happen or go wrong or go right whatever I mean you know you just the realistically the implement the technical implementation of these protective laws never work out the way they're supposed to as a matter of fact I think they backfire because like you know you were saying Parents aren't going to read through all this stuff. Well, I, I bet you 90% of the parents that have parental consent implemented 
on the Alexa device don't even realize that their kids' voices are being stored on the cloud. Now, 80% probably wouldn't have a problem with that, but another 10% might. So, you know, I just, it's, it's, uh, that's a very I'm not the, valid. I just wanted to say real quick, I'm not, I'm not like a, the necessarily the biggest Amazon booster, but it is my understanding that they do not store it for any amount of time. They they do have to, ha it does have to go up to the cloud for it to no, it, figure it is, out. It is stored. It's stored, yeah. Unless you, hmm. unless you specifically delete it, yeah. There's also the they, difference. It's not my understanding for sure. Well, the technology of the cloud has to, the audio has to ship to the cloud. That's so what I was about to say. So there's always at least a temporary storage Right, there. that's what I was, that's what I was about to say, is that it goes up there, they have to process it, but then my understanding is they don't just like keep it for all time. Just for kids' skills, are you saying? Because yeah. it's still retained. You could probably go in and, and see it on, on the app under the kids, what your child actually said, going back months, years. And, and it depends. Right, but that's the transcription. No, but they no, 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 that's the actual audio. You can play the audio file as well. And it, if your skills are not kids' skills, but they're still using them, right? Is the differentiation? Does the device know that it's a kid or not? And these things are also ambiguous. So you have to be okay with the technology and the platform that's being used. So, like you said, if you don't want to store anything on Amazon, don't get a device. Like waiting for. Um, I mean, some devices are being developed that have on-device recognition and things built, but those typically are uh, more limited. Yeah, Zuckerberg hearings have been mentioned a couple of times. I think truly was a, re a watershed event that ended sort of trust by default that does necessarily affect this community. And the other thing that came out of, of, of the Zuckerberg hearings besides the end of trust by default in, the, in tech was the notion that irrespective of the letter of the law and the agreements that you agreed to, there's also the, the issue of informational asymmetry a difference in the knowledge between the user and what the designer uh, know what's going on. And judging by even the, the differences in, in impressions of, of uh, practices, even on our panel of experts, it suggests to me that there is probably very high level of informational asymmetry between the regular user and, and designer. New question, yes, sir. Um, hi, sir. I'm James Falter. I work for Lego. Um, so. I think there's, a, there's just a couple of comments and also a question, but one around the kind of the design choices, I suppose, and, and this kind of information security issue is that I think actually a lot of that stuff is just going to play itself out in a very short space of time, mainly because this behavior happens out loud and in the home. It's not behind a screen. It's not behind a device that parents cannot monitor. Like, it's very obvious when your child is talking to Alexa or to Google Home, and so therefore the control is much more you know, possible in that instance. Um, so my fear isn't particularly that that is, is going to be an issue. I think also with the GDPR implementation now and as Amazon begins to standardize the, the kids to adults experience across all of the markets, we, we launched our first skill for Duplo, um, which is for our, our preschool kids, um, back in April as part of the launch of kids skills in Europe. And the implementation is slightly different there. You don't have the, the credit card authentication model to actually sign up for kids skills. It's just a toggle switch in the app because it provides the GDPR rules of explaining the terms and conditions in a plain English upfront way. They haven't retrospectively brought that to the US, but I very much anticipate that they will. I have no announcement on that, but that's, that would be my expectation. But I think, uh, so, but to pivot the conversation slightly, just because it'd be interesting to get your guys' opinion, is that I think also we need to think about this as being a new medium for families to connect around experiences together, rather than just thinking about these things purely as for kids or for adults, because you're not going to stop, to all of your points, the kids talking to Alexa, unless the parents are also willing to stop talking to Alexa, because there's no way of stopping them, right? Like They've said it by the time that it happens. So just what's your reflections on building things for more family play or family experiences and bringing kids and parents together? So you mean co collectively in engaging in the interaction? Yeah, as we see kind of these devices be kind of often in the heart of the home, either in the the living room or in the kitchen where a lot of kind of family play often takes place. Just what's your perspective? I shared a talk yesterday on how my three-year-old broke your voice app and it was a bit about that. Um, on the underpinnings of like how design on all skills or all apps are um, uh, often lacking in support for uh, basically non-adult male voices or non-adult interactions. 
And it doesn't exclude the fact that children will use them. And so thinking about how you build a skill that uh, understands kids. So when shipping notifications come on, there's that little yellow light on, on the Echo, and my daughter just goes, why are you yellow? And it didn't know how to answer that. Um, like context and things that need to be brought forth to understand the, the additional things. Like that's a totally logical thing to ask. Um, but maybe from an adult perspective, they would try and repair that. But my daughter just asked again and again. Like she doesn't have that. So implementing design that also considers the habits of children, even for uh, adult focused or just general skills would be really, really important. Oh, so the stories that I make, like I said, were aimed at about an eight to ten or eight to twelve year uh, range for a reading. So that would be like a Harry Potter level book. So obviously, even though Harry Potter is for eight to twelve year olds, adults are still interested in Harry Potter. And so I, I my my first thought was, you know, you're on a long road trip with your kids. All the kids are getting annoyed. They're beating each other up in the back seat, and, and you want some peace. You could have Alexa in your car or you know, Google Home or whatever in the future when they all have it. And you could do this interactive audio book together as opposed to just passively, you know, each kid has their own screen. So I think that would, um, and, and, and you know, even though it's not in the car yet, you know, in the home, I've known a lot of people have talked about um, doing the story with their kids, going through and making the decisions together, and they found that really enjoyable. Um, yeah, so most of my games are designed for a family, not for a specific kid, um, for siblings, for parents together. And I can say that like some of the best feedback I've gotten, which got me the most excited, is reviews from parents and emails from parents that like a skill like um, Kids Court, which is um, a courtroom like based where Alexa is the judge and she settles kids' fights. Um, a lot of the emails I've gotten were from parents that said, hey, we just spent like two hours with our 13-year-old kids talking over these things and getting like a really good laugh. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's like a family experience, not so much a kid's experience. That's a great, great question. That's yet another really important distinction between screens that are almost by definition isolating. Uh, it's a great way to... Uh, uh, as a way that the, um, it, it's not, uh, question up here. Um, not so much four to six, I was talking about like four and under um, is what I found on a technical level. Um, on a design level, I've had like challenges with the four to five category. Um, for specific skills where they really have to, I would say, follow a conversation. Um, so for example, there was a skill I did where like Alexa would ask the kids some questions and they're supposed to answer. So a four-year-old, um, in some testings I did, they answered a question, but then they don't really wait for the next one. They just ask Alexa a question back. Um, they are like really, I would say like, when they're like five or six, they sort of like more, I don't know how to say, um, structured in the way that they like wait for their turn and then they are sort of, um, it's like easier for them to interact in the way that we can understand and interpret and respond. Um, if that so it's question. more than just the frequency of the, and the timbre of the voice, it's, it's also the, the structure, perhaps word order, perhaps the spaces between phrases and words. Yeah, they're kind of like the behaviors of a child, saying under five. Um, the, a lot of those devices struggle because there's a thing called endpoint detection, where they're always looking for, to know when the person is finished talking, right? So, and then, you know, so it's a turn taking and children punctuate their words a lot and you always find I have a six year old and he still gets cut off by Alexa all the time. Like, Can you adjust that variable? Is that something that developers have access to by the way? The endpoint no, detection? No, I mean it, that'd be more on my end or the Alexa end that you have to address it. I mean there's one way of doing it quite simply is the fact that you recognize an adult's voice from a child's voice and then you can actually quite easily recognize different age groups based on timber voice and stuff like that. And then you can actually just adjust parameters around endpoint detection and stuff um, in order to be able to respond more effectively to an age group. 
But if you're developing for Alexa or for Google Home, you can't do anything about it. So if it if it can't understand your two or three year old, it's just not going to understand. You can use another provider. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, there's there's a few things you can maybe try to anticipate if you know children were will be likely to use it a lot. So you can one of the common things I notice is my daughter will, um, yeah, she'll start saying something and not finish. So Alexa will hear the first half. So you can follow up and try to figure out what was the remainder of the statement that they wanted to say. Kids stop and stare off at butterflies and things. It's normal. Um, and uh, things like that where you can just observe kids using it and see where they're falling short. I think that's the easiest way. Or, yeah, raise the pitch of your voice and see if it uh, understands different words, slant rhymes, things like that might be translated differently and not mapped properly. So um, there's a couple of quick suggestions. Very good. Question way in the back here. So how do you guys feel about monetization uh, for kids' skills? Um, if you guys do uh, believe in it, um, what would you recommend a kid's skill would need to have in order to be successful at monetization? What age range, um, you know, we've been talking about four to six, six to eight, et cetera, um, you know, would you target if you were to do, be making a kid skill with monetization in mind? I just want to get your thoughts on that. Don't get me started on monetization. So um, it's, it's very difficult to monetize these skills. And the biggest issue is not even the type of monetization options that Amazon allows for. It's more, it's very difficult to get people to discover your skill. And so if you don't have users to your skill, whether Amazon allows you to advertise to your non-existent users, doesn't matter. So right now, the only real way for people to learn about your skill is if Amazon sees your skill, thinks it's great, and then they advertise it in their weekly email, or they'll have a banner ad, or something of those lines. But obviously, that's very hit or miss. And you would think that if you make a very excellent skill that they might pick you up, and certainly making an excellent skill ups your chances, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee you anything. Um, so uh, I think monetization is great. I think that it, there will not be excellent skills unless there are solid monetization options. But right now, if you don't view it, in my mind, as a, a hobby that you can maybe make some additional money from, you're, you're going to be very disappointed because you're not going to become like a multimillionaire a la creating apps in the you know second or third year after um, the iPhone came out. It, there's, the money is just not there in the same way. What are the monetization methods with with these kids' skills generally? Is is it a, is it just having a sponsor to 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 sponsor underwrite the the development, or is there something organic? In the so the monetization options, if you are basically a you know a B to C company, so obviously you could make money creating skills for some other business who and then they can't monetize it. But if you want to you know make money by creating skills that people use, the ways that you can make money are number one, if your usage is high enough, then Amazon may decide to start paying you reward amounts, but this is very sporadic. There's no specific amount that they say that they will pay you. It's not based directly off of your usage numbers. It's very opaque. No one knows what, when or why anyone ever gets paid. So there's that. And even for that, last year, the number one person who made the most money that they give out made just about six figures. I don't know if it was quite there, but it was in, in that range. And so, hey, I'd love to make six figures, but if that's the height of what you can make, and, you know, it's not, again, this is not going to, like, you know, you're not going to be a multimillionaire because of it. Um, and most people, they make, you know, maybe 50 bucks or whatever Amazon throws to them. Uh, other monetization options have more recently been opened up by Amazon, and that is you can now sell things through your skill. So, for instance, with my skill being an interactive audio book, I could have, say, a companion novel that goes along with it. And at the end of the story, it could say, hey, if you liked this story, you would also like my companion novel. You know, say yes now to buy it or however that would work. Um, but I actually created a novel of my skill and put it up on um, Kindle. And I make more money off of that than I do off of the skill. Um, so, uh, and it's not because it comes through the skill. Like, I just get it from, you know, organic uh, stuff from uh, 
book selling. So anyway, um, there are other options. What am I? You can't advertise currently. Um, so Amazon, as you said, is introducing like in skill purchases. Also, um, it's not available for kids skills yet. It will probably be soon. Um, so I basically, you could have like premium content that you you know give part of it away for free, and then part of it they have to pay money to get the other part of it. Yeah, I. Well, as we said before, I don't know if there is enough volume um, in terms of users and in terms of engagement to actually be successful with ISP um, in skill purchases. What about skills? Google Home? Do you know about skill? They have almost no monetization options. That's why whenever it, you talk about it, it's always Amazon. And so as much as I beat as much as I beat up on Am well, it's, it's Google it's, does have. In, they're they're in moving toward it, but not purchasing as not well. really. But anyway, the point is, as much as I beat up on Amazon, that's your only hope at this point. Well, you also have the ability, if you have a subscription model to a premium service, that you can link to it, you know, like you, Headspace. But you know, this. a really interesting thing about all this is we d we're talking about skills as if this is the only method of voice technology. I mean, this is Voice Summit. So, I mean, voice technology is so much more than the voice assistant in your home owned by Alexa, um, Amazon Alexa or Google Home. I mean, this is a technology that I've been working on for 20 years. The industry has been working on for like 40, 50 years. You know, this wasn't a surprise to me that, like, you know, this is all happening now. But I guarantee you it's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, I mean, voice is going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be interfacing more. But I think sometimes we tend to narrow down way too much to because that's what that's our experience right now. I mean, in Ireland, we only got the Alexa and the Google Home in the last, like, year. Right? So it's so new. It's been in the U.S. a lot longer. Um, but... Just that it's it's working now. We're going to see it so much more, and what you're going to see more is more independent providers of it as well, and it won't be so linked to the Amazon ecosystem or the Google ecosystem. It'll be every car manufacturer will have a version of their own. Um, you know, a vending machine will have it. The toys will have it. You know, functionally, you just won't be pressing buttons. You'll be, you know. So I think that's probably. Uh, sometimes we tend to get too focused on what's in our lives right, right now, um, but I think there will be opportunities to monetize stuff. But oh, no, in, that's the, in, the, in the wider world, yeah. No, no, that's what I'm saying. The, the way to make money is to create a product. It's not, it, if you want to make any real amount of money, creating skills right now is not a way to do it. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could honestly make an app of what you're doing and have it all voice enabled and very little, you know, it doesn't have to be, and, and you know, sell it on the app store. Like, I mean, right. there's definitely voice enabling, you know, true what you've, you've dreamed up in your product could work very well on a toy, right? I mean, there's no reason, right? Right, no. Yeah. I, I really yeah. think that the, 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 the future, if, if, or right now, if you want to create a company where you're creating products, uh, there is a company, for instance, called Sensible Objects, and they just raised $3 million in funding, and they're creating board games that utilize Alexa when you play the board game. And um, so I think that you can sell those physical objects in the way that you would sell any physical objects, and people are intrigued by it because it includes Alexa, but having a pure voice app that you try to monetize in, in that kind of, in a traditional way, is not a good way to make money right now. Well, let's give a big thank you to our panel.